Okay, so we're, we're going to start. Yes? Okay, so uh, it's my great uh, pleasure today to uh, welcome Dr. Samantha Curie, who is a, a lecturer in the School of Law and Social Justice at the University of Liverpool. Um, so Dr. Samantha Curie specializes in EU law and uh, migration. Her work covers all aspects of EU law and migration, including migration in the context of the EU's Eastern enlargement, we talked about this today, Union citizenship, the cross border posting of workers in the EU, and gender and uh, migration. And you have published extensively in, the, in these, uh, these areas, um, including on the rights of EU nationals and the uh, rights of non EU family members occupying uh, EU migrant workers, the situation of EU migrant children and their carers, the situation of the often vulnerable migrant workers in irregular employment. And you teach, because you're also a teacher, so you teach EU law and uh, EU uh, social law. So that should be a complete different for those of you who take uh, the course uh, with me on the EU and law. <coughs> should be a completely different uh, uh, way of, of looking at the EU uh, and, and, and the world uh, here. And for those of you who are joining us from the outside, uh, welcome. I hope you find this interesting. I want to say also that uh, Samantha Curry. Uh, is a visiting fellow with the Monash European EU Center. We're very happy to host her. So, thank you. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Oh, thanks for that very kind introduction, Pascal. Um, and thank you to you all for, for staying at the end of the day on a Friday um, to listen to me as well. I really appreciate it. Um, I've been here only for two weeks as a, a visiting fellow in the European EU Center, as Pascal says. And whereas, as Pascaline was just illustrating, a lot of my um, work in the UK has sort of focused on free movements and migration in the EU context. What I've wanted to use my time here to do uh, is to um, sort of take a break from my... Yeah. Sorry, just yell at me if I'm speaking too quiet. Is to sort of take a break from my normal research focus and to begin to think um, more broadly in terms of illustrating um, or integrating into my work um, our Australian perspective and to move away from the general migration context to focus specifically on the issue of, of trafficking. So um, with that in mind, um, I stand here today not as an expert on trafficking at all, and so I would really welcome your uh, views and comments on what I've got to say later on, because I'm sure you've had a really valuable contribution to make to the debate, um, certainly just to the exact same extent uh, that I do. So um, what I would like to do today is to talk to you about the legal and policy approaches that both the European Union and Australia, uh, the Australian federal government are taking toward the issue of trafficking and to start to think about the similarities and differences that exist between these two contexts. Um, and I'll also mention now and again um, the position of the UK as an example of a specific uh, EU member state um, and, and clearly one whose contexts I'm fairly familiar with. And then hopefully this will act as a springboard so that we can start to consider what lessons can be learned moving forward. So in terms of um, the structure of my talk today, um, I'll just begin with a little bit of context setting and talk generally about the phenomenon of human trafficking and the definitions that exist currently. Then I'll move on to um, talk both about the EU dimension and the Australian dimension in terms of the, the law and policy that exists at the moment to address trafficking in human beings. And then finally towards the end, I'd like to broaden the discussion a bit and to um, speculate on um, reflections and concerns moving forward. And because this is, as I said, very much a work in progress, I really hope that you will um, contribute to the discussion at the end so that we 
um, have a bit more of a two-way uh, discussion. So now that the sort of caveats are out of the way, um, I'll move on to thinking about how we define human trafficking. Um, now, it goes without saying, really, that human trafficking and the related issue of slavery are uh, complex transnational and international problems that connect states together, um, some obviously as a state of origin, whereas others more so as states of destination. And because of that, that transnational nature of the issue, the global community as a whole is really um, drawn into the process and prompted into action. So any consideration of either individual country responses, or the responses of a, of a regional entity like the EU, um, can't be devoid of the sort of international legal framework, which also aims to address human trafficking. So to sort of set that scene before we go on to look more specifically at the EU and the Australian approach, it's important to recognise um, the definition that we have here from um, international law and in particular, um, this protocol to uh, prevent, uh, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children. And this protocol uh, supplements the UN Convention Against Transnational Organised Crime. Okay, so you can see the definition here on the, on the slide. We're talking about the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harbouring, or receipt of persons by means of the threat or use of force or other forms of coercion, of abduction, of fraud, of deception, um, or of abuse of power or of a position of vulnerability. Um, as part of this, also it will involve the giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person, having control over another person, and importantly, right at the end, for the purposes of exploitation. Now, I should also say at this juncture that there are clearly other international laws that are relevant to the area, like the, uh, the Slavery Convention or the Forced Labour Convention, but time today sort of prevents us from going into those in any more detail. But it is important to have this um, international definition of trafficking in mind to help us go through and consider more specific examples from the Australian and EU context. So to break down our definition a little bit, um, essentially human trafficking is the acquisition of people by improper means that may be force, fraud or deception with the aim of exploiting them. And frequently in the literature on trafficking we see that there are three components, um, again which is set out here on the slide, so we can talk about the action of trafficking first of all, i.e. the recruitment or the transportation or transfer. The means of trafficking second of all, um, which is connected to the threat or use of force or the deception or the coercion. And then finally, the, the purpose of trafficking. So that may be exploitation in terms of prostitution, exploitation in terms of forced labour, exploitation of organ removal and so forth. So this is the, the international definition as we work with it and the three components of that within. So to give a little bit more uh, background context, clearly it's very difficult to give accurate figures um, due to so much of trafficking being invisible and invisible process. The figures that we do have are just um, up some here from the ILO from a 2012 report and this report estimated that the number of victims uh, of forced labour globally at any time between 2002 to 2011 to be around 9.1 million people. Um, clearly we need to take any figures that we get a pinch of salt but I thought it would be useful to include the figures that we do have as, as a reference point to the rest of our uh, discussion. Um, again, um, 
trafficking impacts on every region of the world. Frequently, it will occur from less developed countries to more developed countries, and it will more often affect people made vulnerable by poverty or conflict. A um, little bit more background, and I apologise for the very simplistic nature of some of these points. I'm sure most of you will be aware of them, but it's just to sort of set the scene for our um, discussion as we go along. In terms of identified um, forms of human trafficking, sexual exploitation is the most commonly identified form. So a report from the UNODC again in 2012 suggest about 79% of the victims identified have been trafficked for the purposes of sexual exploitation. Forced labour then constitutes the, the second most commonly identified form. However, again, we need to consider the issue of visibility here. Sexual exploitation is a form of trafficking that's been given quite considerable academic, media, uh, political attention. Forced labour and domestic servitude have not so far been accorded quite the same equivalence of focus. And there's a lot of suggestions in the literature that that figure, as regards to forced labour, um, severely underestimates the extent to which it really happens. And there's increasing, I think, contemporary awareness of um, forced labour, and that's at international, EU, and individual country level. Um, so there's increasing attention being played, uh, being focused on forced labour, which may um, redress some of the balance in the figures between sexual exploitation and forced labour. Okay, um, women, men, and children of all ages are affected by trafficking, but women constitute the majority of identified victims. Note that I say identified victims. Um, because so much of trafficking is obviously hidden, um, it's, it's difficult to say, but clearly in terms of those identified women outnumber men, although the number of men being identified as victims of trafficking is on the increase. Um, the available reports suggest that women will be more likely trafficked for reasons of sexual exploitation, whereas more men will be more likely trafficked for reasons of forced labour. Transnational organised crime groups are frequently thought to be involved, not always, but um, a lot of the time. And a report suggests that most trafficking is carried out by people whose nationality is the same as that of the victim. Okay, so it will often be um, individuals within the victim's original locality who erase the first step along the process of the, the trafficking cycle. And there's an increasing awareness in the literature and in the reports that female offenders um, play a significant role in human trafficking, especially when um, former victims of trafficking become perpetrators themselves as a means of escape in the uh, country of destination or the locality of destination. One thing that becomes very apparent once you start reading around the literature of human trafficking, as well as the legal and policy initiatives that exist, is that there is a particular cliched um, trafficking story that tends to frame and influence the discussions in the area. So, for example, um, Professor Susan Nebo, who's based at the Faculty of Law here at Monash, she's written a lot about this this sort of cliché trafficking story and how we might need to, to move beyond that to help the debate go further. So, um, in terms of what Professor Nebo has said, she said that first of all, whenever you're reading um, a report on trafficking or um, an, an academic article on trafficking, they tend to follow a certain prescriptive um, route. So the first aspect of it is to comment on the broad scale of the phenomenon. Uh, the second is to refer to its clandestine nature. And then the third is to point out the value of the industry in terms of the, the profits that can be made by the traffickers 
And I realise that what I've said already, to some extent, falls within that sort of cliche response. So I just wanted to point that out to you to sort of recognise that there is a need, I think, to, to move beyond, or as a, as a starting point in the discussion, some of those cliches um, do need to be acknowledged. Um, a, a final point by way of background is that there's no doubt that today it is seen as somewhat fashionable to be addressing the issue of trafficking. So different jurisdictions, whether that's the EU, the UK, um, or Australia, have all been very active in a legislative sense in recent years in an attempt to tackle the problem. And alongside this legislative agenda and framework making, there's been a certain rhetoric about how human trafficking constitutes modern slavery and has been placed in civilized society. And I've actually been really struck about how similar the discourse on trafficking is um, in terms of political discourse and, and politicians um, at EU level in Australia and the UK. And I think at, at sort of this point, halfway through um, my month long fellowship, I've been surprised at the level of convergence there is across the different jurisdictions. Um, certainly I've seen more convergence than, than divergence. Um, so I guess following on from this, one of my questions is, does this apparently shared sense of commitment and outrage result in broadly similar legal outcomes for the different jurisdictions? And then how effective do we deem such responses to be? So that's a sort of question I've got at the, at the back of my mind as I, as I look through this. Now, clearly I've been taking the EU and Australia as uh, my two contexts to examine um, the process of trafficking. But given the very particular nature of the EU setup, clearly we need to acknowledge that this doesn't allow for a like for like comparison. So the EU obviously is not a state and doesn't have unlimited competence to adopt measures aimed at trafficking. What the EU can do though, following the, the Lisbon Treaty, which entered into force in 2009, is enact directives in the area of criminal justice. Okay? So I've just put an article from the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union here to demonstrate that the legal basis that the EU has to take action um, in, in the field of criminal law. Okay, so there's no need to sort of go through the detail of it, it's just to acknowledge the EU's limited competence to act in the area and the competence it, it does have as set out in the treaty. So it can enact directives on um, trafficking. And that's what has happened in recent times. So in terms of EU regulation of trafficking, we have this Directive 2036, which is specifically on preventing and combating trafficking in human beings and protecting its victims. So this was the first measure enacted by the Council and the Parliament, which aimed to um, address substantive criminal law. Now, as it's a directive, we need to um, think a little bit about what that, what that means for member states. Well, directives um, are binding as to the result to be achieved upon each member state. Okay? So directives impose an obligation on EU member states to implement the provisions of international law. How those provisions are implemented in international law is entirely dependent on individual member states. So how it's implemented in the UK will differ from how it's implemented in France uh, and so on. Um, for this particular directive on trafficking, the member states has until the 6th of April 2013 to transpose those provisions of the directive into national law. And I'll come on to say a little bit about what the provisions of the directive are um, shortly. Um, but just to sort of illustrate one of the points I've made already, how trafficking is seen as such a sort of hot topic warranting legislative change currently, I wanted to just mention the recent um, 
legislative activity at um, Australia level. So you can see two recent um, acts here by way of illustration, again from, from 2013. So first of all, um, the Slavery Act, which updates the um, criminal code as regards to the issue of trafficking. So it introduced new offences of forced marriage, and harboring a victim, uh, and standalone offences of forced labour and organ trafficking into the criminal code. And it also broadened existing offences um, of sexual servitude and deceptive recruiting for uh, sexual services so that they can now apply to exploitation in any industry. Um, and I'm not really too concerned about us focusing on the detail of the provisions at this stage, just to, more to illustrate how um, across the different jurisdictions that I'm interested in, it's been seen to make it's been seen as necessary to make changes recently and to broaden the scope of existing trafficking um, frameworks to incorporate um, a wider range of offences. Okay. Going back to the, um, the EU framework and strategy then. What I want to do at this stage is just to give a little bit more detail about how the different jurisdictional approaches um, towards trafficking are working. Both the EU and the Australian federal government, um, and actually the UK government as well, all claim to have in place a strategy towards trafficking. So this strategy, for different um, contexts claim to have, is broader than the legislative framework, but incorporates the legislative framework. Okay? So I want to say a little bit about um, that broader approach of the EU and the broader approach of the Australian government before we give you a bit of detail. So in terms of the EU's approach, the aim of the directive that I've already mentioned to you is said to be to enhance cooperation between member states and it seeks to do that by promoting the approximation of EU anti-trafficking legislation. So it wants to work towards a more harmonised approach across the EU member states and it clearly sees it as beneficial towards the uh, goal of tackling trafficking to have a more commonality of approach across the different member states. So in terms of the goals of the directive, we see um, the three P's, and the three P's come up in the, um, the trafficking um, literature quite a lot. So first of all, there's a focus on the prosecution of traffickers. And second of all, there's a focus on better protection uh, and assistance to victims. And then thirdly, there's a focus on the prevention of trafficking. Okay? So, that's sort of background to the EU strategy. The Australian strategy talks about a whole of government approach. And as part of this whole of government approach, it identifies four central pillars. Okay? These four pillars are not too dissimilar from the, the three P's that we see in the EU framework. So we see prevention again, we see uh, protection and investigation criminal prosecution and victim support and rehabilitation, okay? So clearly we can see similarities in the overall uh, goals of the strategies in place at EU and um, Australia, at the level of the EU and Australian um, regulation, okay? So in terms of the, the broad strategies, there are definite similarities in terms of the goals that are prioritised. In terms of some of the detail, then, I'm not going to go through all, all of the detail on the slide, other than to say that the definition that the di directive gives of trafficking very heavily reflects the definition that I gave you um, earlier on from the, the protocol, the uh, protocol. Okay, so we see pretty much word for word the definition definition from the protocol reflected in the um, direct. 
specifically in terms of how the directive understands exploitation though, I do just want to focus on the detail for a minute because it gives um, more of an understanding of um, how exploitation is defined at EU level. Okay, so we're told that it includes um, the exploitation of the prostitution of others or other forms of sexual exploitation, forced labour or services, including begging, slavery, or practices similar to slavery, servitude, or the exploitation of criminal activities or the removal of organs. Okay, so let's look at the forms of exploitation covered by the EU directive. This goes further than previous EU legislation in the area. Okay, before we had the directive, we had um, a framework decision from 2002, which had a much narrower conceptualization of what would be considered as exploitation. Okay, so our, our new definition includes additional forms of exploitation, like begging um, and removal of organs. Okay, so that's how the directive understands uh, trafficking. Now, I'm sure that many of you will be much more familiar with the um, criminal code than I am, but I've included some detail here for the sake of the completeness just to help us with our, with our comparison. Okay, so we're dealing with divisions 270 and 271 of the criminal code when we're thinking about trafficking, uh, slavery, uh, and slavery-like practices. And in particular, it's Division 271, which includes provisions for uh, trafficking people into, out of, and within Australia. And it also includes uh, specific provisions for, for domestic trafficking, organ trafficking, and, and trafficking in children. Um, so to give a bit more of the specific detail of, of the trafficking offences in 271, um, we don't need to go through the detail, but we can make the, the sort of broader point that we've made, that even though we don't see the text reflecting as heavily the protocol, the influence of the protocol is still felt within, um, within the division. And so the uh, definition that we have of trafficking of the trafficking offence under the Australian Criminal Code still reflects um, the protocol in terms of the action, the means, and, and the purpose of the trafficking. Okay, so I won't go through the detail now, because it's quite heavy textual detail, but if you want me to show this again at the end or, or talk about it a bit more, then, then please do, do stay. Okay, again, I do think it's worth us focusing a little bit more on the exploitation animal though before we move on. So in terms of how the criminal code views exploitation, um, we're told that it will um, occur if the conduct causes the victim to enter in uh, to any of the following conditions. So it includes slavery, servitude, forced labour, forced marriage, which we didn't see within the, the directive's conceptualisation of exploitation, um, and their bondage. Um, so th that's our definition of exploitation from the division. It's broader than that in the EU directive, in that, like I said, it explicitly refers to forced marriage and debt bondage. It doesn't refer to the removal of organs in the same way as the directive does, but organ trafficking under the criminal code constitutes its own separate offence. So it is um, addressed, it's just not within the, that understanding of exploitation um, in the same way as the, the, the directive includes. Okay, um, I think it's useful for us just to reflect on the, on the penalties um, that the different legislative frameworks provide for as well. So under the um, directive, um, the standard penalties that member states must put in place for the offence of trafficking is a minimum of five years imprisonment. And this will increase to 10 years in certain circumstances, um, including when particularly vulnerable victims are involved, such as children. Okay, now 
It's important to remember that these are only minimum standards and the exact scope of um, specific penalties will be at the discretion of individual member states. But nevertheless, those are the minimum standards that the EU directive provides for. Um, for general offence of trafficking, five years, and in aggravated circumstances, um, increasing to 10. We can compare that with the um, Australian approach. Um, so the, the maximum penalty for trafficking offences under the criminal code will be 12 years imprisonment, and that increases to 20 years for aggravated offences. Um, importantly, when offences relating to trafficking in children are involved, the maximum penalty increases to um, 25 years imprisonment. Okay, so this, this, this is where we can see a difference in the, in the scope of the penalties across the different jurisdictions. But we can question at, at, at this stage how beneficial a direct comparison can be because of the nature of the directive and that it only sets out minimum standards for the member states. Um, so just to give you um, an idea of um, what the UK does as a particular member state, the UK currently has a maximum penalty of um, 14 years imprisonment, so going beyond the directive's minimum standard. And this is also likely to change in the near future because we currently in the UK have a modern slavery bill before Parliament and if that is enacted, um, the penalty will be increased to a maximum of life <coughs> imprisonment anyway. Okay, so with regards to penalties, we can see differences, but um, it's one of those issues that is rather up in the air at the moment um, and there will be differences across the 28 member states in any event. Okay, so moving on, on then um, from the sort of detail of the legislative frameworks. I think what, what it's more interesting to do at this stage is to take a step back from the detail and to think about what aspects of the frameworks need further analysis and what aspects of the current frameworks might particularly concern us and, and prompt us to, to be critical. So in the EU context, the main problem relates to how the directive is implemented at national level and whether it's implemented at all. Um, so I've just put a quote, quotation here from um, Home Affairs Commissioner um, Malmström. And she's been uh, very critical of how some EU member states have implemented the directive. Okay, so you can see that she said here, uh, this was a quote from October, but the situation hasn't really changed since then. Um, so, more than six months after the deadline for transposing the directive, um, 18 countries had notified um, transposition of the directive but two had only notified partial transposition, so they implemented some of the provisions into national law, but not others. Um, and of course, if we take a step back from that, that clearly means that eight member states haven't implemented the directive at all. Okay? So that clearly undermines the effectiveness of the directive's provisions and undermines that overall goal of the directive as really you know, wanting to move approach. It, it would be open to the Commission to bring in enforcement proceedings in, in the Court of Justice against the defaulting member states. But the, the usual course would be, first of all, for the Commission to put political pressure on those member, member states. So we haven't got to that stage yet. But I think even outside of the concerns of the member states that haven't implemented the directive at all, we can still be critical even of those member states that do purport to have fully implemented the directive. Okay, so again, to use my example of the UK, the UK claims to have fully implemented the EU directive into its national law. But we can be critical of the extent to which the UK truly complies. Um, and there's a, a centre in the UK, the Air Centre, 
which uh, is advice on it, uh, individual rights in Europe. And the Air Centre has analysed the UK's position quite extensively and um, questions the extent to which the UK approach fully complies with the directive. Um, particularly in practice, it's found that there are significant problems experienced by victims when um, reporting to the police and engaging with the authority responsible in the UK for implementing um, the directive. Okay? And I think we, we can always be critical of the gap that exists between um, the black letter law on the one hand and the practical impact it has on the ground on the other. So it's just, just to keep in mind that um, even those countries that have implemented the directive, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, the national law can be as fully compliant. Okay, so that, that's my first concern, implementation of the EU directive. My second concern relates um, more, generally, more generally to the adequacy of victim protection and assistance. And this concern applies no matter which jurisdiction um, we're considering. Um, to give an example from the Australian framework, in the Australian context, there are, there are two uh, programs or frameworks that work alongside each other. The first is the support for uh, trafficked people program, and the second is the human trafficking visa framework. What is, um, remains concerning is that the availability of long-term support for victims and the attached availability of visas remains conditional on victims' participation in the criminal justice process. Okay? So this has been um, greatly criticised for a number of years, but still remains uh, the kind of norm. Um, in addition to that requirement for victims to be involved in any um, criminal justice process in order to maintain their support and visa, there are also fairly limited deadlines when it comes to um, the assessment streams under which the program runs. So individuals initially have um, 45 days in which they, are, they, they need to sort of engage with the authorities and make decisions about whether they're willing to engage in the process and to try and avail themselves of the available um, financial and welfare support. And that, that's particularly problematic when you have um, victims who have experienced quite complex, um, traumatic um, conditions and circumstances. And interestingly, that this period of 45 days, again, mirrors the approach in the UK. It's a, it's a similar situation under the framework in the UK, where individuals have 45 days <coughs> in which to express to the authorities um, the conditions that they've experienced and to try and access the available support. Okay. So this, I've, I've used the Australian context as an example here, but there are more general concerns about um, victim support uh, across the different um, jurisdictions. To give um, a little contrast though, you can see um, some aspects of the directive here, which we don't need to focus on all, but under Article 11, the text that you see in red there, the directive actually um, states that member states in the EU context have to ensure that assistance and support to victims are not conditional on the victim's willingness to cooperate in criminal proceedings. Okay, so there is um, a point of departure there between the two different frameworks. But like I said, in terms of how that affects people on the ground, it will depend on the willingness of the individual member state to implement that into international law. And I think if you just look at this final point here, member states must ensure that assistance and support provided are sufficient to ensure a standard of living that will at least enable the victim to subsist. This doesn't particularly suggest a very high um, minimum standard in terms of the level of protection 
the victims will be entitled to under EU law. Okay. We are talking about possible fair minimum fee that member states are required to provide to victims of trafficking. Um, I just want to mention another provision of the directive which is um, questionable. So Article 8 here provides that um, Member states are entitled not to prosecute or impose penalties on victims of trafficking for their involvement in criminal activities which they be compelled to commit as a direct consequence of being subjected to um, the offence of human trafficking. Okay, so the directive doesn't say that victims cannot or should not be prosecuted, just that member states are entitled not to prosecute. And this aspect of the directive has been subject to um, heavy criticism by NGOs at EU level who have argued that a more robust principle of non-prosecution as regards to victims um, would send a better signal in terms of the, the EU's approach to trafficking. So I thought that would be uh, just worth taking note of. Um, Okay, just to sort of pull together my, my current thoughts on, on the process so far then. Um, the law and policy, as I've been able to analyse it so far, across the different jurisdictions that I've been looking at, seems well-intentioned. Okay? But so far, it's failing to have any significant impact on, on the appearance of traffic. So convictions are low right across the board. Um, so the statistics that I could find in the Australian context show that up to June 2012, there had been only 15 convictions of people for trafficking and slavery offences in Australia. There have been some more since, but still the number is very low. Um, there are no EU-wide statistics, but in, in the UK context, there were 49 convictions between 2008 and 2012. So again, low, given, given the scale on which we suspect trafficking takes place, convictions are significantly low. Um, and the current approach of the different jurisdictions, as I've said, there are more points of convergence than divergence, and they, they all sort of concentrate on creating offences of trafficking, um, attaching penalties to those offences, and then putting in place various schemes to allow victims to access some level of support. Um, so what we don't have at the moment are any approaches that um, seek to address the underlying circumstances that initially lead to exploitation and the broader structural problems that um, enable trafficking to take place. So I don't have the answers, but I think the current approach of fiddling around with the legislative framework, as well intentioned as it is, it seems to be missing the point um, quite significantly. And to go back <coughs> to, the, to the three P's of uh, prosecution, protection and prevention, the prevention element seems frequently to be sort of left left behind um, and we seem to concentrate more on the prosecution and the protection, but then even those we don't seem to do particularly well. So th this is where my, my, my current thoughts are leading to at the moment. And just in terms of my final, final thoughts uh, before I, I finish, um, in terms of taking the analysis forward, I think another problem tends to be that trafficking continues, continues to be addressed predominantly um, under a migration model. So um, in, in Australia we've seen that the issue of visas for victims remains contingent on um, engaging with the criminal proceedings. In the UK we see the migration model coming into effect as well because it's the UK board agency that's responsible for providing victims with assistance. Um, that's problematic because the UK board agency's um, predominant role is to uh, enforce migration laws and migration rules. And so I think there's a problem with a, with a body that is 
purposely led to the immigration, then having to be responsible for providing assistance and protection to victims of trafficking, because they almost implicitly uh, make assumptions about the rights of those individuals to be there. And I think so. I think there will be benefits of detaching the trafficking analysis from the immigration analysis. Um, difficult to do in practice, most likely, but I think um, to, to look at trafficking um, outside of that immigration focus will be useful. So in terms of what I've learned so far, there's um, definitely been more similarities and differences across the um, jurisdictions. What I haven't done yet, um, and which I will do is put my sort of lawyer hat on, is to review um, the case law of the area and to look at what the courts are doing um, in the area. I haven't yet um, been able to look specifically at the issue if it affects children, because clearly um, child trafficking raises discrete issues which couldn't be incorporated here today. And then I think a final point that I think requires more discussion is uh, the tendency to assume the trafficking is slavery and that slavery and trafficking are used interchangeably in a lot of the literature and the discourse. Um, so that's things that I would like to look at um, given the time and for the rest of my time here. So thank you for listening to my currently um, quite half-baked thoughts on, on the issues and I, I would really welcome um, your comments and, and your views and knowledge on, on any of the issues that we've considered. So thank you. Thank you.